20 years later from a book he'd found in the library. My own opinion is that, um, that the fawn was, was inspired directly by um, a book that had come out about Gauguin sculptures in the early 60s, I think it was, by, by, by Christopher Gray, I mean, as a sort of catalogue of all Gauguin ceramics. And um, actually, I've got a, a copy of it, I'll show you. And, and this book um, was a reprinted again at the beginning of the 80s. Uh, and amongst the illustrations in it, it's got sort of lots of little drawings of things that Gauguin may have done, but I don't know if you can see this, but right early on there is this picture of uh, an early sketchbook. It's actually in the Louvre in Paris. And if you look in the corner, that's our fawn, isn't it? Sean's talents had reached new heights, and he was now practically inventing his own masterpieces. But the family was growing to resent the fact that they were only making a fraction of the profits from his forgeries. The fawn had been bought by a top American museum for a reported $125,000. But the greenhouses only got £18,000 for it. If Sean saw some of these things and got more or less what we call peanuts for them. And the people that have bought them from Sean for very little have made massive profits on them, which I know they have. What happens then? Feeling ripped off by the art world they'd originally set out to deceive, the Greenholchers now embarked on a new project, so ambitious that it would dwarf all of their previous achievements. This time, they decided to bypass the dealers and target their local museum, right on their doorstep in Bolton. George had already sold them a series of fake sketches back in the early 90s. In January 2002, he came back with something far more impressive up his sleeve. It was one of my curators, Angela Thomas, who uh, got a call from a, a local person who had a, a statuette that um, he didn't know what it was. It was under the stairs, and uh, would she be interested in coming have a look at it, because it, it looked quite old. And she went around there and, and had a look, and first, first impressions were that it was quite interesting. The statue had been passed down through the family and he thought it was worth about £500. He'd had it valued by a dealer who said it was worth about £500. And if for any reason we weren't interested in it, well, he'd use it as a garden ornament. The experts believed that George's garden ornament was in fact a 3,000-year-old Egyptian statue which represented a sister of the boy pharaoh, Tutankhamun. From this moment onwards, she'd be known as the Amarna Princess. Initially, the um, items were taken to Christie's and their Egyptology experts valued the princess then at half a million pounds. If the sale went through, the greenhouses would be rich beyond their wildest dreams. That woman in the Bolton Museum, she said that's 500,000. And what do you remember about that piece? Well, I remember my, my dad having it in the 1930s, when I was little. Believing George's story, and reassured by the reports they'd been given, Bolton pulled out all the stops to get the statue for the museum. Raising that sort of money is not something you just fill a couple of forms in and do, and you don't, it's not even just as simple as applying for it. You make phone calls, you talk to people, um, you enthuse, you get support. Uh, it went on over quite a long period. It was not easy, and there were a lot of times when I thought genuinely that we were not going to raise the money. Eleven months into the negotiations, George turned the screw. If Bolton didn't come up with the money quickly, he was going to sell the statue to the highest bidder. 
there was a risk that it would go to auction. And the auction date had been fixed. And if Bolton Museum hadn't raised the money for it to be bought prior to the auction, then who knows what would have happened to it. It was therefore very important to Bolton that we should actually help them try and purchase it before it actually went into that auction, which was the big risk for them. George's threat paid off, and within two weeks of making their request, Bolton Museum received £370,000 of public money to buy the statue. Well, when I got the phone call from the National Heritage Memorial Fund, which was the, the really big sum, and uh, they said, yes, we'll fund it, that was fantastic. The princess was deemed so important that after she was bought, she was shown to the Queen as a treasure saved for the nation. What you have to appreciate about this piece is the quality of the carving and perhaps try to understand that it is a masterpiece. It was definitely a jewel in the collection and we had displayed it beautifully. When Bolton put her on show, the museum was the busiest it's ever been. There was a real feeling of pride by councillors, the museum, uh, the friends of the museum, everybody that was there were really proud that Bolton had managed to pull this one off because it's a big acquisition for a museum like Bolton. For the Greenhouses, the princess was the crowning achievement of over 15 years in the fakes business. But two years later, one tiny mistake would cause their whole scheme to unravel. And when the truth was revealed, it was far more bizarre than anyone could have imagined. Despite having made over £400,000 from selling their statue of a sister of Tutankhamun, it appears the greenhouses wanted more. Sean continued making his forgeries. To tell you the truth, when I, when I sold that uh, princess, the, the amount of money frightened me off for a while, and then I started on these these panels last year. I just I just have to do it for some reason. By 2005, he'd moved on from ancient Egypt to the Assyrian Empire and carved a set of stone reliefs worth up to £300,000 a piece. Then George sent pictures of them to the British Museum, claiming they'd been in his garage for years. One of them, the largest, purports to be of the, from the reign of the King Ashurnasipal and come from um, Nimrud. Another one um, shows um, a, a pair of uh, horses. And the third one, which particularly attracted um, our attention, uh, actually shows a campaign in Babylonia uh, of the Assyrian king um, Sennacherib uh, and it describes his capture um, of a city called Dilbat. Their plan was carefully designed to persuade the experts that they'd unearthed yet another lost masterpiece. Was that exciting? Very exciting, yes it was, and um, it's something which we would very much like to have had. John Curtis wanted to see...